Dr. Anna Lemke, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so um, there's so much I want to talk to you about. Um, I read Dopamine Nation when it first came out, and then I saw you on, you. on Rich Roll's podcast. And yep. I was all excited to talk to you then, and then we had to reschedule, and I just reread it. And it's like reading like reading a totally different book for me. Like there's oh, so many things uh -huh. that like I looked at my notes from last time and like this, like the conversation I want to have is like quite, quite different. So I'm really interested in, you know, partly the maturation process of my thinking, but also that I think I'm a different person now. So I, I, I kind oh, of how interesting. Okay. Well, th thank you for, um, you know, uh, watching the rich Roll podcast. He's such a thoughtful um, and smart person. And uh, I really enjoyed my conversation with him. And thank you for reading the book, not once, but twice. Um, you know, once when 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 we people who write books write them, we we really um, are very touched. At least I'm very touched by someone willing to engage with that material. So thank you. Yeah, well, it's so well written. So um, thank you. Is that all? Is that all you? Did you have like you know? Yes, it is. Or... Yeah. That's great. No. That's, no, yeah, that's thank, you. A, a, thank you. Thank you. Tremendous narrative gift, which makes it thank easy. Um, well, I also have the great blessing of my generous patients willing to, you know, share their stories. So that that also um, made it possible. Yeah, yeah, and I love you know that you you've constructed essentially a story out, out of these different stories, um, which is different. Like I've st I I didn't finish. I've started listening to. Um, your first book, Drug Dealer MD, which like feels like much more clinical, a lot more you know footnotes and and, right. uh, and and facts and figures. One of the things I got from that is the irony. Maybe we can start here. Is when you started your career, your one stipulation was I don't want to treat anyone with an addiction. Right. So, right. so I found myself yeah. curious about kind of how you know from childhood, like what what made you want to go into psychiatry and what did you think it was going to be about. Oh boy, that's a there's a long answer to that. I'll try to condense it. So basically, um I went to medical school pretty certain I wasn't going to go into psychiatry just because my family is riddled with mental illness and it sort of felt too close to home. Mm. I'm including a very close family member who was hospitalized on the psych unit when I was a medical student. So that all felt too threatening. So I initially went into pathology, but as I found myself reading one pap smear after another, I was like, this isn't actually for me. Um, so I switched to psychiatry. And the story with getting into addiction medicine is is somewhat similar. So my cho my choosing psychiatry was it just felt really purposeful from you know the personal perspective of family members with addiction and also just endlessly fascinating. I, I've also always been interested in improving the quality of people's lives through relationships, through time, rather than necessarily the quantity of their life without also improving the quality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and psychiatry was just a real, also a very, just a natural fit for the way that I think. And then addiction was, you know, that involved some negative countertransference toward people with addiction. My father was a high functioning alcoholic. I don't know, he would never have called himself that, but you know, he would go through months at a time where he wouldn't drink and then he would binge drink for months at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of repercussions for our family. And it wasn't something that I really looked at and processed. But also in medical school and even psychiatry training, we didn't get very many, very much teaching about addiction. It really wasn't considered to be a medical disease. It was considered to be like a social problem that people had to deal with before they came to see their psychiatrist, um, which is crazy when you think about it, but that's sort of the way that we were trained. So it took me a long time to sort of make my way into addiction. And really, I mean, I hate to sound like Paul Blart mall cop, but, uh, you know, addiction <laughs> medicine chose me and, and not the other way around. I just real, I realized, oh my goodness, like all of my patients have some kind of addiction problem. I better figure out what's going on here. And they, in the end, were my best teachers. You know, I asked them, uh, when I started to ask them about their uh, addiction, they were eager to talk about it. It was like a huge uh, unloading. But if you as a psychiatrist don't ask patients specifically, they're not going to volunteer that information for so many reasons. Um, so when I started to focus on and learn from colleagues and read and do research, um, what I discovered is that 
I mean, it just absolutely leveraged the care that I could provide. I, patients got so much better um, than they had when I was ignoring their addiction problems. So that was then for me personally rewarding and reinforcing. I was like, we should all be treating addiction because it's like at the core of so much of what these folks are struggling with. So that, that was sort of the evolution. Yeah, well, it sounds very biblical. It's almost like a, a Jonah story of like anything but addiction, right? Yeah. Any, any, anything <laughs> but mental illness, anything but addiction. Oh, yeah. well, here I yeah. am. I know. I wish I could be one of those people who could just figure things out in the beginning and draw a straight line and go, but I'm just not one of those people. So, uh -huh. Well, you know, but it also uh, mirrors the kind of advice that you give at the end of the book so poignantly about, you know, I'm, I'm going to see if I can find the the line, immerse yourself fully in the life you've been given, right? Like that. that's right. Mm -hmm. Like your own life is a model of, okay, for first thing we're going to do is avoid because that's kind of baked into our neurology. And then right. when that doesn't work, we can either try to keep avoiding, which leads to, you know, addiction, or we can, yes. we can turn and face the gale. Yeah, very true. And you're absolutely right that 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 advice comes directly out of my lived experience, um, including my professional lived experience, that, that when I finally turned toward the problem of addiction, that was louder and louder knocking on my door. And I opened that door. Um, you know, my, my joy in my work really um, exponentially increased because I was serving the purpose, uh, a purpose of my life, you know, and it was work, by the way, that nobody else wanted to do. So that's the other thing. I think we're so prone to be looking around at other people and what they're doing and say, oh, I, th that, that I should go do that. Mm. Um, and, and when we do that, we're ignoring the thing right in front of us that maybe nobody else is doing, but that really needs to get done. Hmm. It's it's funny. I mean, one one thing that um, that occurs to me is when you talk about like no one wants to talk about their addiction. Like you tell the story in the book. I think I think you call her Lois, this woman that you disliked at first sight, who is in, to in total denial about having a problem. Like she just wants you to keep prescribing these mega doses of, of medication and is resistant to anything. And then when you ask her, tell me about your life, she immediately tells you a story of addiction. Like, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's so funny how we can develop these narratives. So she had developed this sort of, you know, illness narrative, a mental illness narrative. She needed these pills to treat her mental illness. And so for her, it was all kind of well circumscribed and it made sense. There were huge chinks in that narrative that she really genuinely couldn't see. Um, but then, you know, what's uh, so well, what I what I say to medical students is if you find you're having difficulty empathizing with the patient or, or you're getting impatient with them or, or you don't like them, um, slow down, take a step back and go and get the, their autobiographical narrative, see where they came from, find out what are the forces that shape them over time. And that just totally opens up empathy because when you see what, you know, what people have gone through in their lives mm. um, to get where they are, you just realize, oh my goodness, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go I. And then all of a sudden the relationship shifts and you can, you, know, you can work with people because you understand them, because you, you feel empathy for them. And then that dislike or irritation sort of disappears. Yeah. I love to use that phrase because you use it in the book in terms of like one of the benefits of AA is when people come and they tell their relapse story and you frame it almost as a, you know, like this could be schadenfreude, but like for a medical student, it's very easy to be sort of schadenfreude about, you know, people that you're superior to. But to recognize, like, I'm imagining that, you know, all of us have, as you mentioned, like we, li we live in dopamine nation. All of us are prone to various addictions. And to be able to see someone else's and to see, you know, oh, mine, mine is so high functioning. I haven't, you know, I haven't run anybody over while drunk. I Like, right. whew. Mm -hmm. Now, right. thank goodness I get a chance to deal with this before it gets to the point where some of the, these other people are. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the main functions of a group like Alcoholics Anonymous, is, as I see it, is to work as a kind of extended hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. So our hippocampus is where we store our memories. Prefrontal cortex is largely about 
um, autobiographical storytelling. We're always constantly telling stories about ourselves to ourselves uh, using the information that we can retrieve from our hippocampus about what we remember. And we misremember a lot of stuff and the stories that we tell can get, they can go astray. They can deviate quite far from, um, you know, objective reality, which I believe can be known. So AA really helps us uh, retrieve those memories we'd rather not look at and tell stories that are true um, and remind us, oh yeah, that's what happens when I uh, use that drug. And my brain was liable to tell me it was no big deal hmm. or it was, you know, it was a good outcome when it really wasn't a good outcome. So I think that those stories that we weave in our own heads versus the ones that the healthy stories we tell with others who are helping us do like a little reality check are really instrumental in people getting into recovery. Mm, yeah. So I want, I want to kind of get into the first, the, you know, the pain pleasure seesaw model, but before I said one, one other sort of like meta framing of the conversation is I, I want to admit that I have two interviews scheduled for today. And so I was like cramming over the weekend and there were times where I got, was really getting confused about which, like I was out in the garden and then like, which book was that in? And I want to say the, the, other, <laughs> the other book, yeah. the, the, the cognate book to, to Dopamine Nation that I've been reading is um, it's called The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary. Oh, and, nice. And mm -hmm. it's about basically about our addiction to self-esteem and to yeah. needing to do things to be to be well thought of by others and specifically to be well thought of by ourselves. And I just kept finding mm -hmm. all these, you know, it's a very different, but it's written by a, a psychologist who's, you know, also about mindfulness. And then in the end, like basically you're all about mindfulness as well. Like bring it on the whole lived experience. So. Um, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of where, yeah, where I, I'm coming from. I, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that it's it's interesting that a lot of books that are coming out now and, and a lot of our individual and collective thought process is converging on a similar strain of ideas. And that's sort of how culture changes through time in a kind of sort of synchronous way people hit on the same idea. And and it's it's their original thought process, but it's it's comes out of, you know, the organic sort of collective um, consciousness to the same place, which, which is encouraging in that it says that, that that's, that's kind of where truth lies, right? That p these disparate people kind of from different training backgrounds doing different things are all kind of landing on the same basic, uh, you know, central, uh, truths. Yeah. And so it's just to, to, you know, to frame the conversation about, addiction and, and dopamine. Like, I love how I think in the it's either the introduction or the end of the first chapter, you point to the people suffering with addiction as our teachers, as yeah. you know, our canaries in the coal mine, because we're all mm -hmm. we're all there and they have things to teach us, which is such, a, such a, a generous way, you know, as opposed to the stigma um, approach or the criminal, the criminal approach that uh, Right. That our, our society tends to take. Can you just, let's begin by just talking about like what really blew my mind, especially in, in the Rich Roll podcast. And then when I read the book is this idea of how pain and pleasure are really part of the exact same process and the same neurochemicals and the same brain regions. And can you talk about that and how, how we know it and why it's important. Yeah. So in looking at the brain over the past 75 to 100 years, using many different uh, research techniques from neuroimaging to animal studies to uh, electroencephalography studies, injury studies, what we're finding is that the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain and they work like opposite sides of a balance. So if you were imagine like a teeter-totter in a kid's playground, that's how we process pleasure and pain. When we experience uh, pleasure, it tips one way, and when we experience pain, it tips the opposite way. And there are certain rules governing this balance, and the most important is that the balance wants to remain level. And with any deviation from the neutral position, our brains will work very hard to return that balance to the level position, or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. So for example, when we ingest an intoxicant, a drug, we get the release of dopamine, the pleasure neurotransmitter, in this specific circuit of the brain called the reward circuit. 
and our balance tilts to the side of pleasure. But no sooner does that happen than our brain adapts to that increased dopamine by downregulating dopamine transmission, not just to baseline levels, because we're always firing dopamine at a tonic baseline level, but actually below baseline levels. And I like to imagine that as these little neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again, but they like it on the balance so that they stay on until it's tilted an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. And that's called the come down, the after effect, the hangover, you name it. Now, if we wait long enough, those gremlins hop off and balance is restored. But the key lesson here is that the way that the brain restores homeostasis is first by tilting an equal and opposite amount to whatever the initial stimulus was. So that means for every pleasure, we pay a price. Now, to understand what's happening in the brain as we become addicted, we need to get to the second rule of the balance. And the second rule of the balance is that with repeated exposure to the same or similar rewarding stimulus, and by the way, all drugs work on the same common final reward pathway and release dopamine in the reward circuit. But with repeated exposure to drugs, that initial deviation of the balance to pleasure gets weaker and shorter, but that after effect to pain gets stronger and longer. And eventually we get to the point where we've, we've accumulated thousands of gremlins on the pain side of our balance, enough to fill this whole room. And we've changed our hedonic or our joy set point so that now we're walking around in a dopamine deficit state with our balance tilted to the side of pain. And this is the addicted brain. And in the addicted brain, you need more of your drug and more potent forms over time to get high, but you also need to keep using that drug just to level the balance and feel normal. And when you're not using the drug because you're trying to stop or you can't get access to it, then your balance is tilted to the side of pain. Those gremlins are jumping up and down there and you're experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, which are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and intrusive thoughts of wanting to use your drug and narrowed focus on your drug, which we call craving. Mm. And so one, one of the things that really hit me when I first heard that is like the, the, the second cookie is no longer for pleasure. Right. Right. So like the, mm -hmm. by this, or, or the second bite of the first cookie, like once right. I've gotten the pleasure mm -hmm. that, that now I'm having a little bit of a come down and there's almost an anxiety mm -hmm. it's at, at play. Yes. And that, that kind of, that really shook me because, you know, I'm, I eat very well and I'm an overeater. So I was like, mm -hmm. well, I just like, yeah. you know, join, like the, join the club, join the club. Right. Sometimes I say we all have eating disorders because when you live in a world of food oversupply and when the food has been drugified with the addition of salt, fat, and sugar, as our food has been, um, of course, it's, it's hard for all of us to you know, manage and limit our consumption. And your observation is absolutely key. We want that second cookie before we've even finished the first cookie because we're already tilted to the side of pain and craving has set in. We want to watch the next Netflix episode before we've even finished the first Netflix episode, which is why that button appears with next episode right away. And we can, it's all we can do to not press it, right? We want to watch another TikTok before we've even finished the first TikTok. And 10 TikToks in, our pleasure pain balance is going further and further to the side of pain. And now we need an infinite supply of TikToks just to kind of try to crawl our way back to homeostasis. Yeah. And you know, one of the, one of the phrases, memorable phrases that you use in the book, remember you, you borrowed it from, from someone is like a cactus in the rainforest. Right? Yeah. We're yeah. Dr. Tim Mc... Yeah. So say, say, the, say their name. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Dr. Finnecane. Yeah. From Johns Hopkins. Finnecane. Yep. Go ahead. You know, and, and as someone who's worked with people around food and exercise, like there's this idea that, okay, so we're all trying to maximize pleasure, but we've, we're, we've done it historically, evolutionarily in a in, in an environment where, the, where there wasn't that much pleasure to be had. So it made sense to go for every single bit you could find. Um, That's right. And there was also like, I love the chapter about sort of chasing pain in terms of like, you know, cold showers or things like that. Because um, it seems like pain was far less, we were far less able to avoid pain in the right. old days. Like this morning, I was gardening for, for an hour and a half. And about half an hour, <coughs> excuse me, half an hour in, I could feel this thing on my leg like, oh, no, a, a fire ant bite. Right. And that thing... <laughs> It was only like, one. Ah! 
<laughs> right. You know, usually like, you know, I just disturb, disturb a nest. There's like a, do, you know, a dozen of them all right. over. But this was just one, but I was, because it was one, I was able to sort of focus on it while I'm digging for sweet potatoes. And right. just like, okay, like, I just want to go, you know, I could easily have avoided that. Like, I don't need to grow my own sweet potatoes. I can buy them for $2 right. a pound. Yeah. And, and yet, like, there's something about the, disc the, ple the discomfort. It was also, like, close to 90 degrees. I was sweating like a pig. I was down, bending my, you know, over. The, it was a totally voluntary experience um, that I don't have yeah. to have. But we don't have to have that anymore. Right. No, and we largely don't. I mean, when you think about this pleasure pain balance, really it's a directional phenomenon. So if you're starting out in pain and you're moving in the direction of pleasure, even if your net is still to the side of pain, you're happy because you're moving in the direction of pleasure. And for most of human existence, because you know our li life has been nasty, brutish, and short, literally, and our in day to day existence for most humans, for most of humanity, was a state of pain they probably had a lot more pleasure because they were in pain, moving out of pain, right? Uh, Whereas we're the opposite, right? We're, we're, we, we're stimulating ourselves with pleasure from the moment we get up to the moment we go bed, to bed at night and everything in between. So directionally, we're always headed toward the pain side as those gremlins try to restore homeostasis. And that's makes for, you know, paradoxically kind of harder lives. Wow. Wow. What comes up for me is there's an old uh, quote from uh, Ram Dass's guru when he was given an insane amount of LSD and nothing happened. And he said, you know, you right. Can, I love that. He yeah, said, you can't right. take the bus to Detroit if you're in Detroit. <laughs> yeah. like we're, we're all in Detroit, yeah. pleasure Detroit. There's no there's no. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. That's so interesting about the directionality of it. That yeah. that speaks to a lot of the behavioral economics that I've read mm -hmm. around like. You know, right. you get a you get a ten thousand dollar bonus, but you were expecting a twelve thousand dollar bonus, so you're sad. Yeah, that's right. Right, exactly. <laughs> yes, uh, so true. Um, so one one of the things that I wanted to really explore with you, and this is like before I listened to you on Rich Roll, I had a very negative um, impression of of AA. Right. Uh, based on some of the things I've read, like the Lance Dodes, um, you know, that basically it's a, a cult that was never, you know, that we never looked at whether it worked or not. It had a very low efficacy rate. It was based on, you know, voodoo. And so when you said, no, it's actually like as effective as CBT, as motivational interviewing, it's cheaper. It doesn't work for everyone. Like I went back into the literature and what I found was really angry people writing, <laughs> yeah. writing about whether the disease model of addiction is is right or not. And, mm -hmm. you know, in one of the footnotes, you say, like, there was this article that that um, that talked about self binding and came to what you think is the wrong conclusion that self binding proves mm -hmm. that it's not a disease, whereas you think mm -hmm. it proves it is and it's untractable. And therefore, we need to take step. Can you talk a little bit about just the, in the context of whether it's a disease or a lack of willpower or a social problem, like uh, help us yeah. sort of navigate. Uh, okay, that, so the yeah, argument. well, there, there's a lot. There's there's a lot there. Um, you know, I think the best characterization of addiction is that it's a biopsychosocial disease. So it is a disease, but it's not a disease quite like cancer, right? There's this huge environmental and psychological contextual aspect to it, but there's also a very real biological aspect to it. P people are born more vulnerable. Some people are born more vulnerable to addiction than others. If you have a biological parent or grandparent who was an alcoholic, you're at increased risk of becoming an alcoholic yourself compared to the general population, even if raised outside of that alcoholic home. When we expose our brains, as we've been talking about, to, uh, you know, addictive substances and behaviors, we change our brain. We change our physiology, right? Those gremlins accumulate on the pain side of the balance. Now we're in addicted brain. That's a physiologic difference from somebody who's not addicted. So that biological piece is strong, but there's also this you know, psychological and contextual piece, the contextual piece, for example, being that we live in this addictogenic society where almost everything has become drugified. We have drugs that didn't even exist before, making us more vulnerable to the problem of addiction. I think that 
you know, the disease model is the model for our time because of these biological changes, because of the differences in biological vulnerability, but also because we diseaseify things in order to solve them. Mm. Um, there are a lot of things that were, you know, 200 years ago were considered social problems and social organizations like religious organizations stepped in to care for people who had those problems. We don't do that anymore. Now we have doctors and hospitals and clinics and other types of, you know, medicalized professions and institutions to care for the most vulnerable among us. So we can't leave addiction out in the cold when we're treating a lot of other complex biopsychosocial uh, diseases as diseases. Um, you know, it, we're living in an age of diseaseification. It's not the only lens through which to understand the problem of addiction. There's clearly, uh, you know, a religious or spiritual lens. There's clearly a philosophical lens. There's a behavioral economics lens. You know, there are lots of different lenses that can. Um, help us gain insight. But the medical model is certainly an important medical model. Now, I will say Alcoholics Anonymous, it's really too bad that we're in this age of AA bashing because there's scientific evidence showing that people who actively participate, um, you know, do better um, than those who don't actively participate or uh, even do better in some instances than people who are getting professionally mediated treatment. So there's evidence suggesting that uh, AA is actually the best intervention for the most severely addicted and that those individuals will do better in AA than they would, for example, going to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So I think the key is that we don't just want to, don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, we want to acknowledge that there are many paths to the top of the mountain and that, you know, different folks will need different things. Interestingly, AA was one of the earliest uh, addiction organizations to say that addiction is a disease. They were the ones who coined this phrase that uh, people who are uh, alcoholic, and that's their language, alcoholic, uh, are have a, an alcohol allergy. Mm. So this concept of like that there's an innate difference. You might be able, Howie, to drink alcohol and have no problem, but you know, an alcoholic, they just can't do that. And it's an innate biological difference. And there's just so much truth to that. Uh, that I think, you know, AA really deserves a lot of credit for acknowledging that there is this enormous inter-individual difference and what might just be kind of a habit that could be self-adjusted for one person is it, just never going to be possible for a person who has the allergy or the disease of addiction. Mm. And I think there's there's some grace in that, that, that I started feeling like in myself like especially listening to you talk with Rich, who has a you know a, a publicly acknowledged history of alcoholism, where like for me, my one of my thoughts about AA was that it basically created a narrative in which no one gets to take responsibility or have agency because they're powerless. So you know I was very um, into like rational recovery types of things, like you choose, you decide, and then for, right. for Rich to say, and then for you to to explain biochemically that once your brain has been conditioned, you could abstain for 20 years and then one drop, like his brain is very different from mine. And that me trying to right. impose my own sense of strength or morality on him is, is an insult. Yeah, I think that that's good to see that. And also, you know, interestingly, I mean, AA's philosophy is like most great philosophies, highly paradoxical. Hmm. So at the same time that rooted in the philosophy is this idea of surrender to a higher power, AA's motto on you know front and back of almost all of their brochures is the three words, I am responsible. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, we are responsible for what we can change. Um, we can't be responsible for what we have no control over, but there is an aspect of, of our choice that we, we can, we can choose. For example, I may not, I may not feel that I can stop drinking, but I can choose to go to a meeting today. Right. Mm -hmm. And then through going through a meeting and participating in the 12 steps, you know, I find that I can stop drinking. So, so mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really a, a complicated and fascinating, um, duality there. Yeah. So one thing that I personally have had problems with around the AA mentality, as and maybe as it is kind of expressed in, in popular culture, is I've worked with a lot of people who are trying to change their food habits. And 
or start exercising. And the way they think about it is they've, okay, I've been eating clean for six weeks now. And it's almost like they're counting chips. And the, the longer they go, it feels like the, the more likely they are to slip up. As opposed to like, if you were trying to play the piano or get better at something, the better you get at it, the less likely you are, the more confidence you'd have. And yet there's something about like the counting that I think really got in the way of a lot of my clients noticing the improvement. It just felt like the longer the, 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 the streak, the more was at risk and the more likely they were, like they were holding on by their fingertips. Um, yeah, so 12-step AA and NA and 12-step, they have a term for this and they call it the dry drunk. And what they would say, you know, take it with the, however you will, is that, that those individuals who are just counting days but are what, essentially white-knuckling it, um, they're not drinking or they're not eating their, their food, their, their whatever their, drug food, their food drug is, but they're not engaging in the types of behavior change, both active behaviors and mental states that are required to get into true recovery. Mm. And, and, you know, AA's philosophy is that the heart of addiction is uh, basically a narcissistic personality problem or what they call self-will run riot hence the need for surrender. Uh, it's the letting go of I'm going to control and manipulate this situation um, instead of kind of uh, finding a way to be in your life, surrender to your life, find the flow of your life and the harmony of your life uh, such that, you know, you can live your best life. Um, you know, that, that's recovery. The, the stopping the drug is like the first step Right. And physiologically, it's, it's necessary to restore homeostasis, but it's just the beginning of recovery. Real recovery is a, really a, a profound psycho-spiritual transformation and a reorientation on your life. Mm. So you've, you've written the book, I think, for individuals, right? It's not a policy mm -hmm. book. That's right. Um, and yet you toss in lots of like... To me, like dog whistles about like, oh, she agrees with me on this social issue or this political issue, right? Like the dark side of capitalism is one of your subheads. Right. And mm -hmm. one of the things like when you're talking with Rich Roll, you're like, look, this is, you know, this is who we are. You could take a perfectly well-adjusted person, give them heroin for a couple of weeks and they'll be addicted. Doesn't matter what kind of childhood they had. Um, and yet the other thing I'm thinking is like, okay, but I'm, I'm a node in this society that invented heroin and created a network of drug dealers with MDs to, you know, and created um, all the drugified foods. Like when you, when, you, when you look at, and the other thing is, is that you, you mentioned at the beginning of Drug Dealer MD that there's some research that suggests that indigenous societies may be able to consume large quantities of things that we would consider addictive and they don't get addicted. So I'm wondering, do you have a critique of like society at large? Like, like what's wrong with us? Yeah. So let me just back up a little bit and just to fine tune your representation of my, my thoughts on this matter. Cause it's not quite that I believe that you could give anybody heroin for two weeks and they would be addicted. Okay. What I, what I tried to say and, and what I'll try to phrase here carefully now is that you can have a perfect childhood and a great family and wonderful friends and meaningful work. In other words, all of the things that we consider to be part of a flourishing, meaningful, good life, and you can still get addicted, which is a little bit different mm -hmm. than saying, if you give anybody heroin for two weeks, though, that, that's not yeah. quite right. You know, that's not quite what I meant. It's more that you don't have to have any of these, you know, risk factors. There are lots of risk factors for addiction. We talked about innate biological risk factors, but unemployment, uh, trauma, uh, poverty, um, access, uh, you know, uh, uh, epigenetic changes due to your uh, early upbringing, uh, coping strategies. Those are all risk factors. Co-occurring mental illness is a risk factor. Uh, you can have none of those risk factors and you can still get addicted was, was my key mm. point. Yeah. In terms of sort of the broader sort of societal or political issues here, I mean, one of the the main messages of of my book is that Addiction is essentially the end product of any successful capitalist system. 
I mean, what, what capitalism, and this is not a diatribe for or against capitalism. There are many great things about capitalism, the way that capitalism um, celebrates and encourages, um, you know, human potential and, and the most extreme versions of, um, you know, human invention. Those are all amazing things. Uh, but the dark side of capitalism is that we, uh, you know, I, I consume and therefore I am, as opposed to I think and therefore I am. Mm. I consume and then therefore I am. We we are a society of consumers. That is our job in a capitalist society. We have to keep the economy burning hot. And the way that we do that is to consume things. And so naturally, the, uh, you know, the, the final place that we're all converging on is a place in which we are consuming ourselves to death and exploiting our planet. So this, we, we've reached a tipping point, right? We're, we need to now stop and pull back and say, hey, a lot of great things about capitalism, but there's some not so good things either. And how are we going to handle those? Hmm. And, and I mean, your <clears throat> the advice in the book is mostly for individuals, right? Like how can, and, and it's, it, you know, on the one hand, I'm reading it thinking, OK, well, I do a lot of those things, right? I take my cold showers and pour ice buckets over my head and engage in unpleasant, <laughs> you know, I exercise, which is never fun. Right. And um, and so I get to feel like, well, this is, you know, this is like a great self-help book for me. And on the other hand, I, I think like this is it's such an unnatural thing you're asking us to do. That's not going to work. <laughs> Like, you know, oh, God, ah, I'm mm -hmm. special. Like, I could have my own little narcissism party right there. But, you know, it's just like the idea of chasing pain rather than pleasure and limiting our pleasures just goes against, you know, it's the cactus's uh, physiology. Well, what I think is so fascinating is the way that culture often mirrors these biological and physiological trends, um, which is to say that we have... We, we are now chasing dopamine for its own sake. Um, and we have a culture that's telling us that that's good and that we should be chasing dopamine and that pain in any form is bad for us. And so we, we raise our children, you know, largely with this conception like, oh, you know, we don't want to traumatize children. We don't want to stress them out. We don't want them to end up, you know, uh, with PTSD and uh, on some psychotherapist couch later in, in their adult lives. You know, we want to make sure people... Um, you know, are comfortable. And really, at the end of the day, that's just a story that we're telling that mirrors and fuels this uh, dopamine chasing problem. So I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic than you are, because I think we can change the narrative around this. I think by recognizing the way that the relentless pursuit of dopamine for its own sake actually leads to anhedonia or the inability to experience pleasure at all. If we can realize that and tell each other that, and raise our kids with that awareness, I think we can we can change the narrative and then change the values and then say, you know, wake up in the morning and say, hey, do do something that makes you, you a little uncomfortable. You know, don't, it's not to say don't start cutting on yourself, right? It's mm -hmm. not the extreme things, but uh, hey, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's hard to get out of bed in the morning if you don't have to, right? And there's nobody lording over you with, with you know, a whip to make you do it, but you got to do it. And you got to put your shoes on and you got to go outside because if you don't, if you don't, you're going to end up in this place. That's it's really an unhappy place. Yeah. And the people who come to you tend to be at the, you know, the end of their rope, so to speak. Right. So they're more it feels like they're they're more willing to listen, like the people I've seen and tried to just gently talk to who are still functioning. It's almost like the disease is it has another brain. And you, you can't like you can't get through to them. So it's almost it's almost, you know, I almost want to like form a little police state and like force people, <laughs> you know, like, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. if you, your true self is locked inside and there's a jailer who's who's mediating your experience and your choices. Um, right. Well, this is why I really like, you know, the dopamine fast as an experiment, because I see a lot of people who actually are not interested in stopping their drug of choice and they don't think that's the fundamental problem. They want me to give them a pill for their anxiety or their depression or their insomnia. But when I suggest to them to do their own little experiment and abstain from their drug for long enough to reset reward pathways and see how they feel 
and they're, they're willing to do it. And, you know, many of them, if not most of them are, they will come back and say, wow, I feel better. And then I don't really need to mm -hmm. use my powers of persuasion because they've done the experiment and they, uh, wow, I cut out video games for a month and social media for a month. I didn't go on Facebook or, or Instagram and I feel less anxious. So then they have their own data and then, then they, they're motivated themselves. So I think this is part of, part of the key is figuring out how to gain entrance to get people to do some of their own, um, experimentation so that they can be motivated by that initial evidence. Mm. So I don't, I don't want to leave without talking about uh, smartphones. So, okay. so after I read Dopamine Nation the first time, I, I went out and bought a flip phone. <laughs> and oh, okay, great. And I gave the people that I, that I that would need to get in touch with me that new number, I kept my other phone, my smartphone off. And that worked great until I went uh, on a business trip to San Francisco and I needed like maps and Ubers and stuff like right. that. Mm -hmm. And then I was, you know, then I was back. But the, like that two weeks, I was getting a lot more done. Um, right. I don't know if that's a sustainable thing. I just tried to, to re-up my thing and I can't figure out how to put new minutes on it. So. <laughs> yeah, they don't make it easy. That's for sure. Um, well, you know, these are, again, good for you. You kind of did the experiment. You know, this is, I think what we're all engaged in now is how can I have a healthier relationship with this technology? Almost everybody is realizing they have some unhealthy aspects to their relationship with the technology and their devices. So we're all trying to figure it out, but it's, you know, we're fighting the good fight. And I think that's the key here that we're not just saying, oh, it's all, if it's digital, it's good. Mm -hmm. You know, give your kid an iPad, baby Einstein. We're all kind of now having the conversation, oh, there's really some not very good things about this. And chief among them may be the subtle signs and symptoms of depression, anxiety, and insomnia uh, that we're getting from over-engaging with these devices that we don't even realize the devices are, ca are causing until we take a break from them. And, you know, so you took the break, right? Mm -hmm. And you noticed, well, one thing you said, you noticed you got more done. I hear that from a ton of patients. I had a lot more time. I got a lot more done. But the other thing I very commonly hear is I'm less anxious. I'm less depressed. I'm taking joy in more modest rewards. I'm more present for my children. I'm more present for my partner. Those are all really good things. And so th that, that doesn't mean it's then easy to maintain, um, you know, that, that distance from our devices, but it certainly does mean that we now at least have the insight to, to have the motivation to try. Mm. And one of the things I think about when I like go out in public, which I haven't done, you know, in three years mostly, but you know that everyone's got you know cell phone posture. Right. Everyone's on the devices all the time, and there's like a part of me that's saying like this is the apocalypse, like this is this is the worst yeah. thing ever. And then you know, as someone who studied history, you know, we know from back from Socrates that like you know, chiseling words on stone or the printing press or like right. television was that everything was going to be the end of, of civilization as we knew it. And I'm kind of, <laughs> right. I'm kind of torn between like, is this narcissism that I just want to live in the end times and feel like this is like, or like it really, but it really does feel like a fundamental shift in what it means to be a human being. You know, we're clearly going through a, a, a revolution, you know, the digital revolution, the communications revolution, the supply chain revolution, the overabundance revolution. I mean, I don't think, I think history will show that this was, uh, you know, a, a time of enormous upheaval. On the other hand, you're right. We, we don't want to over vilify it. There are a lot of amazing things that are much better about our lives now because of uh, this innovation and this technology. So it's, it's, you know, I think it's just human nature to want to kind of go to one, one extreme or another when the truth almost always lies somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. So it's not about, first of all, we'll ne we're never getting rid of the technology, you know, as, as, as folks say, the genie is out of the bottle. But, um, but I, I do think that, that this discussion about wow, how, how do we really want to show up for our lives and for each other? Do we really want it to all be virtual? And I, I think the resounding answer is no, <laughs> we don't. And that wouldn't be a good thing. Um, so let's figure out, you know, how we're going to create some tech-free spaces and, and tech-free times and tech-free rules um, so that we can maintain, you know, and optimize our humanity.
Yeah, I'm thinking about, you know, my my friends who are high conservative or orthodox Jews who just have a day in which like all these crazy right. rules like that that come from in centuries of interpretation of thou shalt not start a fire. It's like, well, I can't right. turn a light on. Right. I can't use my elevator on my 47th yeah. floor. And it turns out that there's some sort of wisdom to a Sabbath. Absolutely. Yep. Including a digital Sabbath or a tech Sabbath. And I often recommend this to families, like especially, you know, families with younger children, but also, you know, if you can do it with teenagers or tech free vacations, but the digital Sabbath is, there's a ton of wisdom there, like just a moment to reset, let those gremlins hop off and reset your balance and go into the week, you know, with kind of a clean mental slate. I think it's super important to do that. And it's much easier to do collectively than all by yourself, mm. right? So you went and got, you know, your your flip phone and you stopped using your smartphone, but you did it by yourself, presumably. If you had done it with, you know, a group of people who are often also seeing each other in real life, much, much easier. Right, right. In fact, the, the, the effect of me doing it by myself was to alienate myself from groups more. Right, to isolate you. That's right. That's mm. right. That's right. Which is why it's not just an individual problem. It is a collective problem. It is a societal problem. We do need, you know, government and schools and the corporations who um, produce and profit from these digital drugs and devices to kind of also participate in this discussion about how we're going to live healthier in relation to them. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, to me, like one of the primary addictions is the, the market's addiction to quarterly profits. Right. right. Like if, if that addiction isn't curtailed, then then all the other ones are going to be much harder to deal with on sort of yes. an individual basis. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so um, it's time to me to let you go. So you can have your your bio break. I just do you have 30 seconds. Just say, like, what do you do in your life? You talked about really movingly in the book about an addiction that that um, that you were facing. You've talked about some personality traits that have made it very difficult to have a relationship with your mother and yeah you know so very open and inviting of, of your reader to also examine like where you know where am i twisted um yeah what do you so what do you do sort of day to day to just inoculate yourself against the constant onslaught of the next addiction or the recurrence of an old one well, um, I have a lot of practices that I do that I must do in order to try to preserve my sanity. Um, and, you know, they pr it probably starts with making sure I get enough sleep. Um, I have a lot of insomnia. So mm. there are many nights when I will wake up tired, but I'll get myself up anyway because I don't want to sleep in and then get the problem of having even more trouble going to sleep the next night. I try to exercise every day. I'm of an age now where I can't exercise that hard, but I try to do something every single day. Um, you know, I try to eat right. Um, I, I use a lot of spiritual practices. I, I pray. Um, I try to, I, I practice radical honesty or try to, which I talk about in my book. I try to be honest. Um, I try to uh, make amends when I've done wrong. Um, so these are the kinds of the sort of daily regular practices. I'm trying to pay attention. Um, I'm trying to pay attention to my life and to the people around me. I'm trying to listen. Um, I think oftentimes we just, we don't, we, we think we're listening, but we don't really hear. Mm. Um, and I think as a parent of teenagers, not that we indulge their every, uh, frankly, almost psychotic whim, <laughs> but, you know, we have to listen. We have to listen and, and hear where um, we're not being helpful. So these are, these are the things I try to practice. Mm. I have so many more questions and I'm not going to ask them. So I'm uh, in, the, <laughs> in the pursuit of enough. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, Howie, for having me. I've, I've enjoyed our conversation. Oh, I have so much. And I've been looking forward to it for so long. And I'm so thrilled to, to meet you and to, to know you're in the world doing such, such oh, thank you. wonderful work. So thank you so much. Well, likewise. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you.